the boundary there is quite clear, but when you're in public, it's a little bit more challenging and we need more guidance from the Supreme Court. When we look at some of the opinions that have come out, and, and Sonia Sotomayor, who stated that this goes back to the early colonial days, when government had free reign over searches and didn't feel that they, they needed any kind of approval from the, the legal system to maintain searches, and this is a violation of Fourth Amendment rights. And then in contrast to her, I believe it was Alito who said, this is a digital age. This is not the 18th century. Our personal information is out there. And in the digital age, you just really can't restrict it like you could. And so the government and government agents are not subject to the same kind of restrictions that they were in colonial times. Dr. Darren Hayes is chair of the Computer Information Systems Program at Pace University. And that's some of the news for Thursday, November 10th, 2011. The news was produced in New York with Jose Santiago, Rebecca Miles, Lucas Reckhaus, and Ken Nash. I'm Andrea Sears in New York for the WBAI, listener-supported news. Record 49.1 million Americans are now living in poverty. Well, New Jersey Governor John Corzine is stepping down. Take a look at the cost to do business, banks doing business with other banks. Nobody trusts anyone. I'm occupying Wall Street because. If you're not outraged, then you're not paying attention. I am occupying Wall Street because of the economy. I'm unemployed. I'm homeless. I'm here because I care deeply about what's happening to the country. I'm 70 years old, and my entire life savings, my retirement, my IRA was literally embezzled by Wall Street brokers. The people are getting nothing. People are losing their homes. People are losing their life savings. They ain't right, man. We let these giant corporate banking behemoths rob the American people. I want to see a system that works for everyone. It's time for us as citizenry to stand up and say, this is unacceptable and we're not going to take it anymore. I want to inform people that capitalism doesn't have to be the way. This country needs an enema. Well, the world needs an enema. So you have to ask yourself the question, what matters? The weakest of all political demands is give me something to vote for. On September 17, 2011, we made the power of the people visible to the entire world. Overcoming division, we found common ground at Liberty Square. We're here, and we ain't going nowhere. All right. Welcome to Occupy Wall Street Radio on WBAI Thursday night. Thank you for joining us. We're also streaming online at WBAI.org, and we are live streaming video from the studio, and you can tune in at livestream.com slash OccupyNYC, the official live stream channel of the New York City General Assembly. Um, so tonight we're going to be kind of running down a bunch of sort of political developments that are cooking out there. Um, we're uh, basically, uh, I'm sorry. You all want to introduce yourselves? Yeah. I'm Sade Dona, and I occupy Wall Street. I'm John Nefflin, and I occupy Wall Street. I'm Dan Fight, and I occupy Wall Street. Sorry, I jumped <laughs> over that one. All right, so, uh, John, you want to lay this out? We're going to begin tonight's show with a quick pre-recorded interview I did with Dan Levine, also of Occupy Wall Street Radio. 
This is John Neffel with Occupy Wall Street Radio. I will be talking to Daniel Levine, also of Occupy Wall Street Radio, about an event that he just attended at the White House, the action to protest the Trans-Canada Keystone uh, XL pipeline. He's giving me the down spirit fingers right now. There is big news today as the Obama administration has sent the program back to the State Department for re-review. Some uh, analysts are saying that this effectively kills the project. And uh, we just wanted to get um, Daniel's thoughts on this. Daniel, thanks so much for uh, being on Occupy Wall Street Radio. Thanks, John. So can you describe sort of your initial reaction to hearing that the State Department is going to have this this re-review and whether you think that is a victory or uh, just a sort of bump in the road towards this happening? What what are your thoughts at the outset? Uh, um, So I was happy and surprised a little bit because when I was down at the protest, um, my impression of it was that it was very, very, very subdued for a 12,000-person protest. Right, right. So can you t- talk talk a little bit more about that? Because we had Ethan on before, and uh, and, and I, I feel like your impression of the of the action was slightly different than his. And so uh, we'll talk about your, your impression of that day. Well, I'm used to a certain level of intensity in the protests up here at Occupy Wall Street. Um, and I think a lot of the other people that, that are here are, too. When I was down at the White House, it felt overwhelmingly white middle class in terms of presence, and it felt to me like if people didn't get what they wanted, they would kind of just go home and feel sad about it, and that's (laughs) all they would do. And I know that's a really awful generalization to make. It was just, you know, it was hard to get chance going at first until Occupy DC kind of came through. Obama's uh, decision now, just about a week after that action, you don't want to say that that necessarily it was the action where 12,000 people were there, but certainly uh, this was not a decision that Obama made after Chris Hedges and, and several other, uh, several hundred protesters got arrested for two weeks earlier. And and I think that what we're seeing is a he, is just the buildup of intensity uh, in in this movement and just the the fact that Obama can't or or just chose not to uh, ignore it anymore. And I think that that uh, that's a, a really huge victory for the environmentalists. Well, I think what Obama sees in twelve thousand people outside the the White House is votes, and I think that's the way he thinks. He's going to do what he needs to do to maintain a political cover and get elected. This is so urgent. This is the context through which we need to view everything that's happening because this is the unifying tactical problem of our species. Um, we need to continue to have clean drinking water and clean air. And uh, just as a, as a sort of final thought here, what, what do you see continuing in, in the, the, the Keystone uh, actions here? Um, I think it's really important that we keep making the connection between what's going on at Occupy and the environmental movement in general. Um, we are basically offering a viable alternative to the system that is failing right now to address this issue. Daniel Levine, thanks so much for, uh, for talking to us. Thanks so much, John. All right, so, uh, John, do you want to talk a little bit about the political implications? Is it a maneuver to take the heat off, you know? Right. Well, this is, this is I think, one of those rare instances where we can pretty clearly claim a victory here. Uh, Bill McKibben recently uh, wrote uh, earlier today, I believe, that, that there's a very high chance that investors are going to start backing out with this delay. And he also said that this is a delay that would have been unthinkable six months ago. And so the massive groundswell that we've seen forced Obama to to delay this. And uh, I, I think that the danger here is that he's going to delay making this decision until after his presumptive reelection. And then uh, at that point, there just needs to be continued force like we've seen uh, to, to keep him from allowing this pipeline to happen. It's funny because um, in the park, when I heard it first announced, um, walking by the media tent, Justin popped out of nowhere. I got great news. And everybody's like, what is it? And he announced that the it had been delayed. And the first thing, I hate to sound so negative, that went into my mind is, is this a campaign strategy? Um, even though this is a good thing to have, like, it seemingly, seemingly our voice is heard. That's kind of playing into what's going on and a lot of things that he's been saying for seemingly for the campaign, get out 
there, protest, get out there, vote, change, make this difference. Um, and now that this has been uh, delayed, is this only, uh, is this like a mockery of what, what we're really truly here doing and what we're standing up for? Right. And I think that we've, that, that we've seen Obama go back on uh, many, many campaign promises. Mm-hmm. And, and with it, as with any politician, you can't uh, trust them and you shouldn't trust any politician because they are in the business of getting reelected. That said, this, I, I do think, does serve as an antidote to defeatism. And when people say that you can't make any difference at all and that these institutions are too powerful, what we're seeing right now is a small way that uh, that you can make a difference. And if 12,000 people hadn't been there and if uh, 1,200 people hadn't gotten arrested earlier, this Keystone Pipeline would be going through no problem, and that would have disastrous environmental effects. Right. And also another thing about this pipeline and other pipeline projects is actually that the entire apparatus of uh, fusion centers and surveillance uh, is partly dedicated to spying on people that object to these kind of industrial projects. And I know for a fact, actually, that they put the word out through the uh, – portal called Icefish X in Minnesota that's attached to the Minnesota Joint Analysis Center. They were looking for, uh, specifically looking for people objecting, I'm not sure if it was to this pipeline project or to other ones in the state, but, you know, they're basically, uh, that whole system was really designed to uh, keep shadow this type of uh, political activity and and then, you know, basically help uh, the corporations get initiative over that kind of political resistance. Well, and and I think one of the other uh, sort of important things to to monitor coming out of this is how are media outlets talking about this decision? And The Guardian uh, reports that this is bowing to public pressure. The New York Times had a similar, um, similarly framed story that that this is that this is the White House responding to the environmentalists and to the occupiers who have been showing up. And I think that that starting to frame the media debate in that way of politicians coming to us is an important step in the right direction. Yeah, and I think also it, it shows a couple things. I mean, there were the actions against the XL, I don't know how many, uh, was that maybe almost two months ago, possibly a little while earlier, the big arrests? Right, right. I th- I'm not sure when in the summer that was. But late summer. And so, but the, those that was a huge multi-day, like, sustained action, a lot of people, a lot of high-profile stuff. But what uh, occurred to me watching it at a distance was that they didn't have the same type of independent media center structure that was helping everything. And so the media gave it a tiny bit of coverage, but they didn't give it coverage every day. There was nothing that was uh, pushing forward that image out into the popular consciousness. And I think that was part of the reason why it um, sort of fizzled in its political impact. I think you got to have uh, a media structure like what we've helped as volunteers and, you know, working hard to build here in Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street would have had a much harder time getting traction without that kind of media work, and you saw that the problem with the XL action earlier being essentially blacked out. Right. Well, and the the uh, action with 12,000 people there was also not covered by the New York Times, which is a pretty glaring sin of omission, in my uh, opinion. Well, it, it's omission, but it's it's a decision. It's a right, decision right. to omit. Right. It's not like an oversight, right? No, no. It's certainly not as though they were unaware of what was happening around the White House. Um, yeah, and we were going to touch on this a little bit later, but I think that these are really tightly related, that um, the Occupy movement's just sort of given a lot of manpower that sort of gets thrown at these different things, that like people get on board, they join along. It's, it's a little bit reminiscent of the way that people who consider themselves part of Anonymous will sort of flock to an action that's coming up and then uh, engage in it. And uh, so I think that you've seen the XL thing get renewed energy, and then um, we're going to talk later about the Occupy foreclosed homes that are in a state of about to being seized, you get a ton more people, bodies on the ground to kind of uh, push back on these things, these actions, and get more traction. Instead of just a couple dozen people, you have like hundreds of people doing this stuff. Right, and, and I think that's that's something that, that the Occupy movement so far has been very good at, is, is drawing these connections between these seemingly disparate um, movements of stop, stop, and frisk, or the environmental movement, or um, attempting to keep people in their homes, and we're, you know, really seeing a lot of those being brought together here. All right. So, um, uh, moving along. Yeah. Did you want to throw anything in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is Station ID. You're listening to WBAI 99.5 FN, streaming online at WBAI.org, Occupy Wall Street Radio. Thanks. So another major leg of the energy from all of this is the reaction, especially from a younger generation, of the uncontrolled criminal operations of the financial industry, the banking industry, and the feckless baby boomer lawyers (laughs) that are incapable of saying, 
yeah, you guys did something illegal, and then and their like inability to demand ap- apologies from everyone, and and so now we have right. another manifestation of this you know generational value failure system um, going on where a federal judge uh, you know sort of had enough of the Securities and Exchange Commission's uh, latest packaged cover up with uh, Citigroup. Right. So so the the uh, what Dan is talking about is that a federal judge. This is from the Washington Post report. A federal judge. Uh, challenged the SEC's plan to settle a fraud case against Citigroup for uh, several uh, $285 million. And he said that, that this is an absolute slap on the wrist, that, that the losses in this case were upward of uh, $700, and that, that, the, uh, that Citigroup has repeated... Um, has broken the law in at least three times, been caught by the SEC three times since 2003, and each time they are um, given an injunction that says that you can't do this again, and then they continue to break the law in the exact same way. Well, you know, there was a, a really uh, pretty funny movie, actually, that was made called The Other Guys recently. If you haven't seen that, there's a couple kind of misfit cops. It's, um, you know, uh, Will Ferrell and uh, Marky Mark, uh, you know, Mark Wahlberg. And uh, they're, they're these sort of misfit cops. And they basically stumble across a plan to steal all the police pension funds. And so the mastermind of the plan is, like, works as a private attorney. And he also works at the Securities and Exchange Commission. So there's this great scene where he brings in all the documents proving everything and the villains you know lawyer is like oh thank you very much you did a great job thanks for bringing that to me we always do a great job at the SEC and Will Ferrell is just sort of like oh yeah like you know this case and that case and it was just it was a wonderful riff and then they had you know charts at the end of the film indicating the effect of all the corruptions and bailouts actually right well the the SEC at this point serves as the the smallest possible hurdle to clear in continuing to engage in criminal practices they they all all they do is say if you do this again you're going to have some bad bad consequences happening to you and then that is that is repeated no matter how many times the same event uh the same crimes are perpetrated you know what's interesting is that um a gentleman came into the park last night um one of the reasons why i have not had sleep and uh, <laughs> but um i i'm guessing that he worked him and a bunch of his friends i guessing that he worked around um around Wall Street and it's interesting to have this this dialogue but I, I found him um, coming to to the park asking his questions one of the one of them one of them was about you know Citigroup and what had happened and basically I think he only came in there to point fingers and not to hear but I find that the conversation interesting because when we're speaking of these guys and we're thinking that they're criminals or they're they're bad guys they're, they're actually his his defense was we don't know poverty here like like we know in other places so what we're experiencing here in America is not what somebody would be experiencing in India and so with that being said like when you have court cases like this that get the exposure of being of being um, ne- like negligent to to justice or something like that. Like, what kind of a, you know? How do you reach out to those people who come down from Wall Street um, to talk to us? How do you get them to see the light of what's actually going on, or to to strip them down from defending? Um, their situation or what they feel is right. I don't know. Well, right. And I think when people that are kind of reacting negatively to what's going on, whether they're um, financial industry people or people that are just cruising by saying, you're messing up our city. It's like, well, I just asked them, okay, well, how much have the banks ripped up your city? How much have all these illegal financial operations damaged, you, you know, your standard of living in this city? Like, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's like all these things that all these lawyers and all these SEC, you know, revolving door type people don't realize is that the, the standard of living is declining very fast in this country and for you know, obviously many sections of the public, like their standard of living has been lowered for a while. It's just now that the broader middle class is really eroding quickly as well. Right. Well, and, and the, the whole idea of negligence is something that came up in this in this case, and that's what SEC was charged with. And what, what Rakoff said in challenging that is he said that this is not negligence this is willful acts of of criminality and so to let uh, part of the the decision that Rakoff criticized was was that Citigroup doesn't have to admit wrongdoing and that's a very standard way for these proceedings to to proceed that's what happened with the Goldman Sachs uh, abacus right. case as well is that these firms get to 
uh, issue these very, very small payouts and then not admit wrongdoing. And so, uh, Shade, to answer your question, I think that one of the first steps is to start actually uh, have public pressure be high on, on saying that this is actually wrongdoing, that these settlements can't be chalked up to negligence. They have to be called what they are and not sort of like, oh, well, we all made a mistake here. It's like, no, you, you constructed these securities to explode the way they did, and you made a bunch of money off it. Yeah, and then you constructed a worthless legal system to basically institute a tiny sales tax for whatever criminal operations you have to follow through on prosecuting. You know, one action which, you know, could be called for is just saying anybody in the SEC or other prosecutor's offices that gets these little fines and then doesn't have to admit wrongdoing, right, all of those guys could, you know, maybe call to be fired or, or whatever, you know, because it's just, it's just absurd. And I could compare this to the Republican National Convention in Minneapolis in 2008, um, and uh, you know Amy Goodman, uh, you know Democracy Now. She had a very uh, vicious arrest occur, and then basically the city officials were able to obtain an insurance policy so they could do anything they wanted illegally, and then they wouldn't have to admit any wrongdoing, essentially so that they would never have to face the voters and say, we did things wrong. And then all of that is packaged in a secret system in federal court. You don't find out the terms of it and so forth. And so that's the kind of pattern that iterates through all of this that actually really accelerates the criminal elite deviancy, which is now at a level that's really destabilizing and harming the whole society. So it's just another expression of the same system. Right. Well, and, and uh, in regards to this case, Matt Taibbi described it as if if somebody walked into a parking lot stole a car in 2003 got arrested and said oh i'm sorry i walked into the wrong car i was i was being negligent and then they did the same thing in 2005 and then they did the same thing again right now and 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 it's that it's that what what you said that kind of pattern that um that needs to be disrupted. Right. And then the other thing, too, I mean, uh, the SEC, uh, they're supposed to hang on to files they get from whistleblowers for five years to open, like, you know, potential investigations, hang on to that. And instead, they always, like, shred the files right away. And so, it's, essentially, we need an alternate system instead of the SEC to collect this information, which is why we should, you know, give the shout out to guys like Taibbi that are kind of um, throwing a bombastic narratives out there, but also um, zerohedge.com under the main handle of Tyler Durden basically sifting through all the nitty gritty of this stuff and it's like you might as well just throw it out in the open at this point because these government agencies and also the big media aren't going to touch it but places like Zero Hedge just keep knocking them out of the park and we knew Dexia was going down months before the Wall Street Journal would want to talk about that. Right and and uh, and it's that, that kind of revolving door uh, that, that doesn't there isn't really any significant distinction between the, F, the SEC and private firms at, at this point. They're, they, they exist to further entrench the other in power. And, uh, yeah. and, and so, yeah, so the, the more kind of bombastic, bombastically you can, you can criticize them and, and try to get the, uh, the offenders fired, the better. Yeah, and these, these federal agencies are under a kind of what's called regulatory capture by people like Bill Black, uh, a guy who actually did put bankers in jail during the savings and loan scandal. And uh, when these agencies get so closely linked in their processes, like the way that the FDA gets revenue from the drug makers who, you know, stage spoofed studies and then they approve everything and then they, you know, illegalize all natural everything and the government hoards all the patents for medicine. It's the same type of system, like, you know, in all these different agencies, and it's really sick. And so I hope that while the Wall Street movement can take that on on a broad level and get to the details as well as the big picture. Well, and I think part of it is really just raising awareness. You know, the, the idea in America that the rich are rich because they worked harder or because they create wealth or anything like that really needs to be thrown out. And and I think that the the more often you can, you, can, um, you know, bring to light that these are criminals and crooks and they're repeat criminals. That's that's really the first step in in mobilizing, you know, massive movements is right. just raising awareness about how actually criminal uh, this is. Right. I just wanted to put a quick uh, plug in that uh, Occupy Wall Street Radio has been picked up on four other stations on the Pacifica Network. Uh, WAZU, Peoria, Illinois. WPRR, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, KRFP, Moscow, Idaho, and WTJU in Charlottesville, Virginia. So the age-old American political question, will it play in Peoria? We have achieved that, <laughs> and that's important. 
So um, we just wanted to really t quick touch on, yeah, that, you know, uh, people are taking these actions. Occupy Atlanta has occupied a foreclosed home. Occupy San Francisco is uh, moving forward. And uh, some folks have headed over from Occupy Minneapolis to do that as well. Yeah, and I think that this is this is really a great uh, a great turn for the Occupy movement to take is to just uh, as, as uh, people's homes get foreclosed upon and, and stolen by banks. There's a story about a bank in Maine who just took the wrong house from a family. Oh, yeah. That happens a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the, the, again, the more you can sort of just have people in the front yard and, uh, and, and raise awareness of, of uh, the foreclosure problem, yeah. I think that's a, a great turn. We just had a really interesting, it's funny you guys, we decided to talk about this. We just had a really interesting teaching at, um, for Occupy Wall Street about squatting and going into the two um, occupying spaces, um, like buildings and whatnot. There was a lot of great information given about actually squatting because, you know, we're squatters um, in a building, in an area. What, what piqued my interest, though, is that, you know, when you, you, you technically think of taking of us as occupiers coming from all over the place, going into the space that was already inhabited by um, the people. And it's, you know, that, that can go mm -hmm. on and go on. Um, we're talking about here an issue of gentrification um, that, you know, I think really needs to be addressed. Um, when we come into these neighborhoods and we take up space when we don't know the communities. So I think like even even with foreclosed homes being taken and occupied, I think that's dope. I think we need to continue to do that. Can I say dope on the radio? I just said it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not on the big list over there. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. cool. But um, I, I, I think we need to also consider outreaching into the community and bringing in local local right. um, local issues um, of people being evicted in these places and how they can get involved with the movement as well because it is very important and to know that we have to reach within the communities. Right, absolutely. So as we uh, wind down here, I just uh, wanted to take a quick moment to actually thank all the staff here at WBAI for helping us put this whole project together. They've just done a really uh, wonderful job, and it's been really fun to work with them. I've been uh, here in New York for four weeks now, and I'm actually heading back to Minnesota to kind of relax and unplug from things because I've actually been working on this essentially every day for more than 50 days since it started doing the video and everything. And so Better. I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm not super, burned out yet but i need you know to spend time with the family and stuff and uh, i think we all need to kind of learn how to have a sustainable thing and not have everybody burn out because the occupation has moved into a thing that's been absorbing the trouble from so much of society and uh you know it's just taking it all into yeah, ourselves. yeah. but it's been a really wonderful experience and i'm really happy that it's all played out in such a cool way so far for most everyone involved i think yeah well i'm uh, I'm, I'm giving you the uh, the upward spirit fingers for uh for 50 uh, straight, more than that, uh, straight days of, uh, of working on this. Yeah, it's, it's been wild. So let's uh, run down a, a few events coming up. Um, apparently, uh, theoretically, some people say that tomorrow, 11 11 11, is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Hey, I'm Aquarius. It's <laughs> <All right. laughs> <Yeah>. my age. <laughs> so, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so at 11 a.m. at the uh, sort of tree shrine, all day there will be uh, a kind of a, a yoga sort of thing going on. Um, also, Occupy Printed Matter is starting at 11 a.m. at 195 10th Avenue. Um, and then uh, on uh, Liberty Plaza, at noon, there is a parents and students of color are the 99% in NYC public schools. At uh, 2 to 4 p.m. Um, near the Red Cube, the Safer Spaces Committee is working on uh, an opioid overdose prevention training with Michael Duncan, PA, and Nicole Krampansky, CNP, and uh, to you know work with the overdose issues that happen all across our society. Mm -hmm. um, and then at uh, 3 to 5 in Charlotte's Place, the Open Source uh, Solutions meeting is happening. The techies are uh, moving things together quickly and uh, that happens regularly every week and the next spokes council is at 7 30 to 9 30 at trinity church and so those are just a few of the events going on uh, tomorrow coming into the weekend so and also everybody keep november 17th on your calendar that is going to be a big international day you're going to see a lot of actions and uh, we'd love uh, for everyone to be aware of that anything um, else there's a uh, 11 11 11 you said of it um there's occupy central park a lot of music and great things going on. So, I mean, come up. Yeah, I just want to, again, thank everyone at, at WBAI for uh, taking us through this exciting time, as well as my friends and colleagues at the GlobalRevolution.tv Collective, bringing this live video since day one, and the uh, new NYC General Assembly live stream media team. They're all my best buddies. It's been a lot of fun. So, burr, burr, burr. so 
Ooh. We're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Occupy Wall Street Radio. It's been it's been a lot of fun, and thank you so much to technical producer Reggie Johnson and engineer Michael G. Haskins for making this happen. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Dan, for all you've done. Good night, you guys. Thanks, guys. Good night.